So when I got the invitation, I was a bit, I was a bit, uh, I wondered a bit what I was going to talk about that could interest you. Um, and I thought that maybe, maybe some work on, on augmented Lagrangian methods for finite elements in computational mechanics could be of interest. So uh, this is, this is really two different, I, I would try to, to, to manage to fit in two different applications of this, of this, uh, these methods. Let's see, how can I? Okay, so this is, this is the outline. First, I'll have a very brief history on, on augmented Lagrangians. Of course, this is a, a classical method, so it's uh, surprising that there's something new to say. Uh, I will say some words about the original idea. Then I will discuss a very simple model problem, which is just to impose directly boundary conditions on, on Poisson's equation. And I will show how to make the step from this very simple model problem to the Signorini problem, which is also a model problem, but it's slightly more advanced because, uh, of course, that's a, then it's a variation inequality, so we have a nonlinear boundary condition. And then I move on to some applications. And the application I was interested in, what I'm interested in are typically contact problems. So we'll look at some contact problems for membranes and plates. So in the image here, you see this is a, a spherical membrane that is pushed into some ellipsoid container. So it's constrained to take the form of this ellipsoid. So that is that's one thing that, we, that we've been looking at. But then I was, I've also been looking at, at inverse problems in the form of data simulation. And interestingly enough, and it was, I hadn't seen this in the beginning when I started looking at this, but what, what comes out from this, then the, this numerical analysis of, of the data simulation problem is also an augmented Lagrangian method. So I tried to, the idea was to try to fit these two applications. Okay, so let's, what, what about augmented Lagrangian methods? What is, what, what's their history? Well, this is an optimization method and they were introduced by Powell and Hestness in the early 70s. But they were pretty quickly adopted by the, by the finite element community for the approximation of nonlinear PDEs in the work of Glavinsky and Marocco, 74. And then in, in fluids, so, so they, Glavinsky and Marocco, they looked at the P-Laplacian typically. Uh, and Fortin looked at viscoplasticity in 75. And then there was a series of work that, that popularized this technique by Glavinsky and Etalek starting from 82 when this, this, this very known book on augmented Lagrangians. But so what I've been, what I've been using, what, what led me into looking at this was, was really the, a trick by Alar and Cournier from 91 and the way Julie Hilt and Renard used this trick to, to design a very elegant method for contact using Nietzsche's method in 2013. And at the same time, also in 2000, 2000, 2013, I was work, working on, on finite element methods for ill post linear PDE problems. And I had designed this primal dual stabilized finite element method that I then later saw also fits, um, fits the, the framework of augmented Lagrange. So that is a kind of a personal history of this talk. So what is the original idea? Well, we start with a functional f over a Hilbert space v. And we have a linear map b where that, that maps v to some Hilbert space h. And then I want to minimize f under the constraint that bv is equal to zero. So I want to minimize my functional, but I also want to satisfy this constraint bv equals zero. And if you just set this up as a standard Lagrangian formulation, you will have the function of the minimize, and here you will have your constraint that is added with a Lagrange multiplier, Q. The idea with augmented Lagrangian is to say, well, I'm not, I'm not satisfied with the, with the control that this part gives me for some reason. I will come back to that. And therefore, I will add this 
penalty-like term. So some coefficient gamma times your constraint in this H norm. So we have the augmented Lagrangian. And if, of course, if you take gamma equals zero, you come back to the standard Lagrangian. And if you take away the Lagrange, if you take the Lagrange multiplier to be zero, then you get the penalty method. And if you plug in the exit solution here, then the penalty term vanishes because the exit solution satisfies the constraint. So any saddle point of the augmented Lagrangian formulation is also a saddle point for the original problem for gamma equals zero. And why, so why was this introduced? Well, the key observation is that equation, the, the formulation one has better conditioning than number two. So it, it gives a nicer, this, this uh, augmented functional, this augmented Lagrangian has a nicer shape, let's say, for minimization. So if we, if we look at, so how was this used? Well, this was used originally as an iterative method. So here, equation four gives the iterative method given Q0 in your Hilbert space. You, co you, you fix your Q0. You plug it in the Lagrangian and you minimize and you get your u. You plug your u into the constraint and you update your q and then you iterate. And then typically there's a recipe to choose this relaxation parameter rho or the step length if you like. Now, the interesting thing here is that the convergence of this, what, what was observed then in these early, in these early works and this was really the reason why augmented Lagrangian was introduced, was that the convergence of four is superior if, you, if gamma is larger than zero. And it's also superior to the direct use of the penalty functional because it's a better conditioned system. So, of course, we, will, we, can, we cannot optimize over these continuous spaces, so we introduce finite element spaces. You think of some VH that is in the Feynman space V, some discrete subspace, and some discrete subspace AH in the Hilbert space H. But we said that the, the solutions were the same on the continuous level. However, when we go to the discrete level, they are no longer the same. So this is, this is why I, what I found interesting in, in the augmented Lagrangian and what I think is new in this, um, in this development that started by Shuli and, and Renard, um, that, that we, don't, we don't only use, it's not only to be used as an iterative method here, the augmented Lagrangian. The, the, the idea is that by, by introducing the augmented Lagrangian, we change the numerical method. In some works, you can see, in, in the literature, you can see situations where they, they introduce a method where, where where they just have a constraint and then they say that, well, now we solve this using the iterative method in the sense of the augmented Lagrangian. But they, what they don't say is that actually when they solve it that way, they don't find the solution to their original system, but they will find typically the solution to an augmented Lagrangian. So they are different discrete solutions. Okay, but the, so the augmented Lagrangian we find it then by find, finding the stationary points of this Lagrangian over these discrete spaces. And this is now the classical finite element theory says that we need the IMSEF condition satisfied for these two spaces. So we cannot pick these spaces in any way, but I will not go into these, these, the technical details of this. Um, but of course, so, but the important thing is to see, the, to see that, that the augmented Lagrangian in itself does not help you with the IMSEF condition. You still need the IMSEF condition. But the IMSEF condition will not, the, will not give you complete control of VH. And this is where the augmented Lagrangian will help you. And I repeat myself here, there are different stationary reports for gamma equals zero and gamma larger than zero. But of course we hope that if, we, if H goes to zero, they will be the same. Okay, so what is the key observation here? for the numerical analysis. Well, the key observation is that even if we still need to satisfy the IMSEF condition, the 
having the, the augmented Lagrangian will give us different a priori control of the constraint. And this is because typically, because if you apply B, B to the H, it is not in the space of, Lagrange, of where the Lagrange multiplier lives. So when you multiply it with the Lagrange multiplier in your constraint equation, what, what the method will see is only the projection on, on the, the multiplier space of the constraint. So when gamma is equal to zero, we contr control the H norm of the projection of the constraint on the finite element space. Whereas if gamma is larger than zero, we control the whole of GDH. So now you can say that this might not be important. And in many cases, it, this is not always important, but it can be important in the sense that if, if this guy, if the, 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 com the orthogonal complement of BDH suddenly is big, so there's a big part of BDH that is not seen by your, your uh, multiplier space, then you get poor control of your constraint, and this can be important. And typically it becomes important when B is not smooth. And so now we look at, here in this introduction, I look at linear constraint, but if we have non-linear constraints, then B will be non-smooth, or if we have, also if we have a derivative of the constraints, B can be non-smooth and this guy can be big and we can lose control. And one linear, two linear examples, for instance, is some finite element methods for, for thin plates. You can get shear locking and shear locking can be avoided by the augmented Lagrangian. Another example is if, you, if the divergence constraints in Stokes equations is typically not, um, is typically, then, then you only get control of the projection of the divergence of U onto some, some finite element space. And this typically will be a much smaller space than where the divergence of UH lives. The divergence of UH will typically be discontinuous, but you might want to have a continuous space. And it's pretty hard to design the pressure space for Stokes so that the divergence of the velocity space lives in the pressure space. It's not impossible, but it's, it's tricky. So if you, if you choose not to do that, and then you have the Stokes equation, I don't know if you, there's, there's an equation that is a Stokes equation with an L2 lower order term that's called Brinkman's equation. And if you look at this equation, and then the, the, if you let the viscosity go to zero, you degenerate into Darcy's equation. And that is typically a situation where this lack of control of the divergence constraint will play a role and it will make your method degenerate. So, so convergence order can be lost, or in certain situations, convergence can be lost in time. So why did I, why, why did I want to look at this? Well, we've been looking at fictitious domain methods that, that so, so finite element methods where we don't, where we don't uh, mesh the geometry, but we just plunge the geometry into some, some structured mesh, as you can see in the upper picture here. So you plunge your geometry into this, into this structured mesh, and now we want to impose boundary conditions through the variation of formulation. And then you can do interesting things, like here we have, Poisson's equation inside this popcorn shape, and on the surface we have some some Laplace Beltrami equation. So you can have you can think of you could have this could be some elastic body with a thin membranes over it, and these interact, and you need to model them both, and you you don't want to mesh the geometry. So what happens here is that you you can never impose anything in a strong sense. You know if you solve a simple problem with directly boundary conditions on, on the mesh geometry, you just set the boundary degrees to, of freedom to zero. So, so you pin down the solution on the boundary and you can solve. If you do that here, you will immediately get locking phenomena on the boundary because, because you're not, they are not fitting the space. So you must impose boundary conditions weakly, which leads us to either Lagrange multipliers or what is known as Nietzsche's method that we'll see in a little while. And then 
once, once you solve the linear problem and you look at some different linear problems, you, you, you think, well, what happens if we have a contact problem? So we have an embedded elastic body, and then the, this is subject to contact with some rigid wall or some other body. What do I do? Well, then techniques that impose the various inequalities in the spaces are not possible to apply. So we need something else. So I would, would have thought penalty method. And then this, the nice thing with this is that it's a consistent way to, to introduce a penalty method. So it will not give us the conditioning problems or problems with accuracy that we would otherwise. So let's look at the Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now, we just, we say we have Poisson's equations in omega, u is equal to some function g on the boundary. And omega is a bounded domain without appointing norm at n. Now, the multiplier approach, you see the Lagrangian here. I will minimize the Dirichlet energy under the constraint that v is equal to g on the boundary. And here we have the force. This is the classical multiplier approach. Uh, I, I look for stationary points of this system, and we have u and v in some of the suitable. U and lambda in the suitable Hilbert spaces. And then, as I said before, we, when we need the, uh, some, when we go to finite elements, we need a balancing of these discrete spaces. And we know that formally the multiplier is given by the normal derivative of U. Now I introduce some discrete spaces. Um, this is, so this is some, some, um, Five time space in the bulk, and this is some five time space on the boundary. And now let's do the augmented Lagrangian trick. So we have our Lagrangian here and here, and I add this least squares type penalty on the constraint. Okay, and then if I now check my, my Euler Lagrange equations, I get this. So I, had, so I have an additional term here, which is this guy that comes from the constraint. No, it comes from, sorry, that comes from the, the augment, augmentation. You see it has the gamma. Um, now I will add and subtract this guy, which is then the, the gamma minus one half mu. This is all formal now. I'm going to claim that this is, this is just to show, show some manipulations formally. And, and you see, I take this guy and this guy, and I add and subtract this, and then I can complete this quadratic form to get this guy, and I take away this. And then I have an equivalent Lagrangian, right? That looks like this, but I have to be a bit careful here. Now, when I handle this in, in a mathematical sense, you see, I've shifted this is just a, a technical point. By doing this, I, I need to impose that mu is L2 because I shifted, but to, to obtain this term, I introduced the L2 normal mu. This is not okay on the continuous level, but it's okay on the discrete level because it will be a finite element function, which is that just a technical point. Um, so you see, now I get this, an, a nice alternative form of the Lagrange. And it's still the same. The only Lagrange equations are, of course, the same. And now we recall that I said that the multiplier could be identified with a normal derivative. And now I do this formally in this only Lagrange formulation. So I replace lambda by the normal derivative of u and mu by the normal derivative of v. This is, of course, not allowed on the, on the continuous level, but on the discrete, discrete level, I do whatever I want. And I choose my gamma on this form. And I arrive at this formulation, which is the bilinear form for my Poisson equation. And then I get three boundary terms. One boundary term, this guy, is needed to ensure consistency of this problem. The other boundary term is typically needed, is, is, not, is, is there to ensure symmetry. So it, and it comes naturally from the from the form 
from my, my uh, Euler Lagrange equations by this substitution. And the last term is now a penalty term, but it is a con it, this is a consistent penalty term because everything that contains u here is matched by a g in the right hand side. So you see now vh does not include anything, any, uh, doesn't respect anything on the boundary. It's just a finite element space, all nodes are equal, and I've built in the boundary condition in the variational formulation. So this was introduced by Nietzsche in the early, seven, in the early 70s. And the infinite condition that I said before that we have to be careful here to sing Lagrange mantras, this is automatically satisfied now, provided my gamma is large enough. But by large enough, this is not infinitely large. It typically, it's typically 10 times the polynomial order square. Um, so now we have seen the augmented Lagrangian for Dirichlet boundary conditions, and we found this formulation that allows that where we have eliminated the Lagrange multiplier. So there are two steps. You set up your Lagrangian, or there are three steps if you like. You set up the Lagrangian, you augment it, you, make, you create the augmented Lagrangian, and then if you can, you eliminate the multiplier. So you get only a, one equation in the primal variable. So what about the Signorini problem? In the Signorini problem, so the Signorini problem is typically a model problem for, for contact. Or if you, if you cast it on elasticity, of course, it will be contact, but here we have Poisson's equation. So you can think of this as, if you think of it, Poisson's equation as modeling heat, this says, the Signorini problem then says that the temperature on the boundary must be smaller than or equal to some preset G. And the heat flux must be either zero if u is smaller than g or it must be negative if uh, if u is equal to g and there's a compatibility condition so that if u minus g is equal to zero then lambda is negative and if uh, lambda is negative no um, sorry if lambda is zero then u minus g is not zero is negative and this is now, these conditions can be written by, written on this format. I'm not sure where this was introduced, if it's Rockefeller, but I, I saw it in this paper by Alain Cournier. So they introduced it and they formed this augmented, non-linear augmented Lagrangian. And if you look at this, so now what, if you, this was what we had before. The last line is just imposing the Dirichlet condition on the boundary. This is the linear, Dirichlet condition. If you go from this to this, you see that the only thing that changes is that we put the positive part of this guy. And then we can solve, we get a formulation for this much, much more complicated problem. And the key is that we have this formula that encodes all these conditions together. And here, when we now minimize, uh, so look for the stationary points of this Lagrangian, we can relax and we can forget when we design our spaces, we forget entirely about these, these conditions because they're all encoded in here. However, we still must take care to make sure that we have, that, that these mu and v are chosen in a way that respects the infinite condition. So, we get, we derive it and we get all the Lagrange equations. So we have one equation for the, the, the bulk terms and one equation for the boundary terms. And now you see if, if this guy is zero, then there is no contact. This here vanishes because it's zero. And you see that this equation says that, well, lambda against mu is equal to zero. Oh, sorry, this should be mu, of course, I'm sorry about but this is zero for all mu, and then lambda is of course equal to zero. And if mu minus, u minus g minus gamma minus the lambda is plus is larger than zero, then we have contact, and you see what happens is that uh, this lambda part will vanish, and you will get exactly the standard augmented formulation for the Dirichlet boundary condition. 
So it's this nonlinear switch will really change in a completely natural way between the two modes, contact and non contact. So then the, the, here, now that we come back to the trick we used for the Dirac boundary condition, we say, well, we know what lambda should be. Lambda should be the normal derivative of u, and we do the same thing for the test function, and we introduce that in the formulation, and then we come to this formulation, which is a Nietzsche type formulation for contact. And this was the formulation proposed by Julie and Hilt. And they, so they analyzed this formulation. So why is augmentation important here? Well, let's look at a very simple model situation. I take just the space of affine polynomials between minus one and one. So this is my, this is my, my I, I look at these finite element functions. So here is u of x equals x. And then if I, you see, if I take the positive part, then of course when it's negative, it becomes zero, and then it grows. And the observation is to see that, okay, u itself is in the finite element space, but when we apply the positive part, it is no longer in the finite element space. Of course, because this nonlinear operator, it cuts off the negative part. So, so now, of course, if you have u, if you take the identity minus the projection on this p space of u, this is zero because u is in the space. But if you do the same thing with this nonlinear part, this can be big. And this is really now, so if you just use a standard Lagrange multiplier method, this is the guy that you cannot see typically. And since since it has this behavior, it can be big, and you cannot know where it's big. So typically, um, where you, if you if you go to if you're interested in the mathematical analysis of contact problems where you impose it using Lagrange multiplier without augmentation, has been haunted by the need to impose a, a, an assumption that the contact says, set has some nice properties. It doesn't wiggle too much. You know, it cannot go in and out of contact as much as, I mean, there must be some limit on this. And this is essentially to avoid that this is so big that it cannot be controlled in the mathematical analysis. Okay, now this means that if we go to finite element spaces, we have a Lagrange multiplier method here, which is eight. If we eliminate the Lagrange multiplier, we have a Nietzsche type method here, which is nine. And the nice thing, if you're a numeric analyst with these methods, is that they allow for optimal error estimates. And I think that so this was proven by Shuli and Hilt for nine in 2013. And then we looked at the, the multiplier case, where you get this additional difficulty of the infinite condition uh, in 2019. But in both cases, you get this nice result saying that the H1 error plus an error in L2 on the contact condition converges to this order, and this is optimal. So this was the, the, the interesting thing with Julian Hilt's analysis was really that it was, I think, for the first time, like the, a finite element method with an optimal error analysis for the senior reading problem. However, so, so that is very nice. But there is, of course, a drawback, and that is that the, the contact condition is only satisfied weakly in the L2 norm. So, so you can have penetration, but only within limits of this error estimate. So, so in the limit, there will not be penetration. But, you, but, but for a given, for a fixed age, of course, there can be penetration, but, but our experience, numerical experience shows that this is very, very, typically very, very small. Okay, so this is the first part. Let's sum up. Augmented Lagrangian leads to robust and accurate fan discretizations. So now what we did, and, and of course, based on the contribution by Shuli and Hilt and Renard, is that to show that, that the augmented Lagrangian is really a tool to design finite element methods in itself, and it, it enhances accuracy. Whereas we knew before from previous work that it does enhance iterative solution of, of, of uh, um, of constraint optimization problems. And it makes it easy to integrate various inequalities in FEM, finite, the finite element method. And so I like this, that it leads to a nonlinear equation. 
it's no longer, it doesn't lead to an inequality. It is a nonlinear equation that you can apply Newton's method. And this is useful if you have lots of other stuff going on. So if, you have, if contact is one part of your problem, but there are other things, there are moving parts or, or fluids or, or something else, then you don't want the additional constraint of, of try, having to, to build a variation of inequality into your code. But here you can code the, the variation of inequality as a nonlinearity in an equality and get it as it's an equation as the others and you can solve it in Newton's method. If the multiplier has a mechanical interpretation, and if this is a, if it, I mean, let's say, if it has a mechanical interpretation, it can be eliminated using the primal variable. Now, then of course, it also has to result to some, in something that is, is decent, but, um, but there is this possibility. It might not always be the best choice to eliminate it, but sometimes it can be a good thing. And there is also an interesting link here to st stabilized finite element methods. I will not go into that too much, but, but you, if you, uh, Nietzsche's method can be seen as a prototype method also for stabilized fan. Okay, so let's go on and look at some other applications. Is this, is this only valid for, for the Signorini problem, one may ask, or can we go beyond that? So let's start at the, maybe the simplest classical contact problem, which is, the obstacle problem for a flat membrane. So essentially we still look at Poisson's equation, but we say that now that, that U, which is now a membrane, is constrained to stay above an obstacle here given by Psi. And then we get this variation inequality. So we see that now it's the, the PD here, which has to be larger than or equal to zero. U has to be larger than or equal to Psi, meaning that that U has to be above the obstacle. And then we have this compatibility condition and on the boundary of, of this membrane that just imposed that it's zero. So how can we do? Well, if you follow the scheme, we introduce a Lagrange multiplier, taking up the slack here in this inequality. And then we say that, that we add the Kuhn-Tucker conditions here. So that the psi minus u is more than or equal to zero, lambda is more than or equal to zero, and the compatibility condition looks this, leads like this. So now we can do the same trick because this is just a trick on these on these contact conditions. So we can rewrite it in this fashion, and I see the stationary points of this Lagrangian here. And you see, it looks very, very similar actually to the Signorini problem. The only difference is that I've shifted this integral on the, the augmented Lagrangian to my domain instead of my boundary. That's the only difference now between the Signorini problem, the lateral Signorini problem on the domain boundary and the obstacle problem in the, in, in the inside. And I can derive, I get the all Lagrange equations, and now I do the next trick, which is to formally replace lambda by the PD. And then I eliminate the PD and I get this functional now, which has no dependence on the Lagrange multiplier because it has been eliminated. And I can write this as the Euler Lagrange equations. And this now, if you, if you think of the Nietzsche formulation, if you, if you have that in the back of your head, that the Oshuli hit. This also looks very much like that, just that we have another, this, let's say, residual term here is of another form, indicating that we have eliminated the multiplier for something else. Okay, so does this work? Well, we need, th there is this parameter gamma, and we need, the analysis will tell us how that will scale. So. We need, the, we need to say that gamma is large enough and we know that there is this inverse inequality that the gradient of E can be bounded by the L2 norm of V in the finite element space and out comes some scaling factor here. And that is what we will use to set gamma. So this comes out of the analysis. Okay, then we have, we take, so here's the elevation view. This is some, some membrane that hits a flat, boundary down here, so there's contact down here. 
and this is a smooth solution, and this means that you will get optimal convergence. So if the, if the obstacle is smooth enough, the solution to the obstacle, the obstacle problem is smooth, and we get optimal convergence. And we also get from this very, uh, in a very natural way, we can get an a posteriori estimator that says that we can estimate the error using the discrete solution. And you see up here the top, line is actually is a posterior estimator. You see that in this case, this is a very, it works very well. So this leads to optimal convergence. Now, if you want to look at plates, I will not go through the whole, the whole, the, all these motions for, for, the, for the plate, but you can do the same thing for the plate equation and you will get the same formulation. I do not have a complete numerical analysis for that case as I had for the obstacle problem, because the, the functional analytical framework for plates is much more unforgiving. So um, I am not, it, it, it is not trivial. It's, it's, there's some work to be done, but we haven't done it. But I'm confident that it can be done. Numerically, it works very well. So here we have a Kirchhoff plate. We have, we have discretized it like this. You see, I refine here in the center and I get I have, now I have an obstacle that is like, like a, um, a needle. So it's, 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 a, it's a regularized point obstacle here. It's near point obstacle in the center and I'm pushing up from below. And I get this, so this, I get this deformation of the plate, but it's kept to zero in where the, where the obstacle acts. Oops. Okay. So let's go on to a more complex model. Now we have curved membrane. So then we use differential, tangential differential calculus on the surface. So we place ourselves on the surface gamma where the membrane lives, and we introduce this, um, we introduce this surface strain operator. So we, we take the strain operator, we project it in the tangential direction of the surface, and we can introduce a surface divergence in this form. And then if we introduce a surface stress by Hooke's law for plane stress in the tangential directions and, and with the normal physical parameters, we introduce that, I get an equilibrium equation on gamma. We know gamma is a curved boundary now. So this is a, this is a model in the physical configuration for the curved membrane. Okay, and now I want to do what we did for, for, the, um, for the contact problem, uh, for, the, for the obstacle problem, for the flat membrane. I want to transpose that into the, to the curved membrane. And then if you take the projection in the tangential, the tangential directions of this equation, that should be zero. But if you take a normal component, so, so uh, we will say that a displacement of the membrane in the normal direction will be constrained by an obstacle given by, by G. So the normal displacement minus G is more than or equal to zero on the surface gamma. And we have the same kind of constraint on on the, the equation in the normal direction, and we have a compatibility condition between the constraint and the equation. So this, makes it, it, this is essentially the same thing as for the obstacle problem for the flat membrane. If you look at the last three equations here, but the first equation has an equality because we have more components and we don't want to touch it. There's no friction here, so it's a friction-free curve membrane. Okay, so, we proceed as before, we introduce a Lagrange multiplier that we have called P, and then we get, on the, we get it on this form, and P, the physical integration of, of P is the contact pressure between the membrane and the obstacle. I will go on, I will use the formula, with this, this max of zero and the argument, and I write P like this, and I've defined my bilinear form, for the, for the stress strain relation. And I seek stationary points to this problem. And you see once again, now when we have cast it in an abstract frame, it looks like the other guys. 
And now I can once again say, okay, we said that P was the contact pressure. It is, it will take this form. And I, and I have to discretize now the surface since I'm, since I'm actually working on the surface here with the discretization. I discretize the surface, I introduce a normal to the surface and H is a discrete normal. And now I look for UH in the finite element space. That gives you the stationary points of this discrete, discretized Lagrangian that takes this form. And now you see that I have, so I have the same thing as before, and now I have this guy. But here, since I am in a, on, the, on, the, on the manifold, I'm on the surface, and I take the surface divergence of sigma, um, yeah, sorry, I got ahead of myself. You can also then get the euler Lagrange equations so of this. This looks very nice, and this looks a bit, a bit nasty, but it's actually exactly the same as Julie Hill's formulation, just that we have a different, <coughs> the constraint is acting on a different equation. But now, if we, if we are a bit, we have some geometrical, differential geometrical footwork here, we can actually simplify this and we can replace this divergence of sigma by this operator, oops, sigma kappa, that is written on this, in this form. So it simplifies a bit, this looks a bit less nasty, but then of course we need to introduce the discrete curvature terms. Now, is this well posed? Well, it is well posed on the constraint on this gamma parameter again. again. And then we can do numerics. We can have, we can now, this is what we saw in the first slide. I, take a, a spherical membrane and I push it into a, some, some ellipsoid with different radius here. And if we, if we do a very fine computation, we can, so we don't know what the exit solution here is, but we can do a very fine computation and then we can, we can uh, uh, match, compute on these guys and match towards that fine computation. This is not, of course not a rigorous um, error analysis, but but um, it gives us some idea what goes on. We see that when the when we squeeze it into a this when we squeeze it into this smaller radius, we will get a larger constant, which seems reasonable. So if this is a harder problem to approximate. Than this. Okay, so my last example is thin plates with senior in the boundaries. I will. Um, I think I will just, I will be, but this, you see, it becomes more and more complicated. We have an LS, LS model for this elastic problem here, this, with, with the plate stress moment tensor and so on. I get, sin, I, and now I have a Signorini boundary condition on the plate. So we had the obstacle, the obstacle problem for the plate, now I have a Signorini condition for the plate, saying that the plate is lying on some structure and it's not attached to the structure, it's just, the structure is just um, constraining it to be above the structure. And then we get this system where we introduce the Kirchhoff shear force here. Uh, and once again, I can use the trick to rewrite this, these conditions on this form, 21, I get Going through the same procedure as before, I get this euler lagrange equations for, the, for my, my uh, augmented Lagrangian formulation. I can use the trick to substitute the Lagrange multiplier to come to this. And you see this once again, very similar to Julie Hill's Nietzsche formulation for the, for the Poisson equation, just that now we're working on the plate. It's a much more challenging problem. And now you see here is the plate. I push down in the center. This is the deflection. Here are the Kirchhoff, the, here are the, the contact shear forces on the boundary. Uh, if I shift my point load to, to another point, well, this defle deflection shifts and also the forces shift towards that side. So this all, I mean, this is just to show you and I give you an idea that it, there's something physical that goes on here, right? This seems reasonable. Okay, 
So that is the end of my, the, the, the mechanics part. Now I, will, I don't have much time, but I will just briefly try to give you the idea of this data assimilation problem. Now we're in a situation where we don't know the boundary data anymore, but we have measured data inside here in this subdomain omega using some non-intrusive techniques, we have, we find the displacement. And we want to solve a data simulation problem in the sense that now I want to understand what are the displacements in B given this displacement in small omega. Um, of course, you could say that why not get the displacements in the whole body? Well, there are some mathematical constraints here. So the, the stability degenerates as B grows to fill the whole body, but I will not go into that. So just, let's just look at the, write the problem of linear elasticity on this form. I said that U restricted to small omega is equal to some Q. I have measured data, so I Q tilde, which is Q plus some perturbation delta Q. I introduce a weak formulation for my, for my elasticity equation here. And, but there is a problem, a caveat here, a problem. I'm looking for u in H1 without boundary condition, but to get a weak form, I must test with v in, in the space with boundary conditions. So you see, this is, there's already something that's not so, that doesn't go, on, go, go well here, and this is severely imposed. And the best stability we can hope for is coded in this, what's known as a three ball inequality. It says that the solution in the subset B is bounded by some constant times the solution in the subset small omega where we know it plus whatever is the right hand side of the equation to the power of some theta and theta is between zero and one and now if theta if if um if b is almost only omega if it shrinks to omega then theta goes to zero and it goes to one sorry so we get like a well posed problem if, theta, if B grows to all of omega, theta goes to zero, and you see you lose all control, and it's an equals problem. So that is why B, B cannot grow all the way up to omega. So the data fitting here is to say, is, leads to a Lagrangian, right? We say, I want to find the V such that it satisfies my equation, which is over here, up to a Lagrange multiplier lambda, but it's as close as possible to the measured data in small omega. So this makes sense. But this is unstable. And the classical approach is to use Tikhonov regularization. But Tikhonov regularization will perturb the problem and introduces a first order perturbation that depends on this regularization parameter. So our approach is to say that we discretize this Lagrangian because on the continuous level, it doesn't mean anything anyway, it's still post. I discretize the unstable Lagrangian in some finite term spaces. And then I now I augment it. So you see, I have this augmentation term, which is the, the strong form of the constraint. But this is not well defined because the finite element space is not smooth enough. So I need to work with a broken norm here. So I take this on every element and I disregard what happens over element faces. But then I, 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 I you know, I do some, something, I do a crime here because there can be energy accumulations on the boundaries, on the faces of elements. So I introduced this other guy, which penalizes fluctuations over the, over the element edges in the form of the jump of the gradient. And you see here, why is the augmentation necessary? Well, you can think of it, as I said before, well, the constraint is not in, in the Lagrange multiplier space, right? This is the constraint I want to impose. This is my B, but it's not in the space. And here, since the problem is here posed, the effects are disastrous. I get Euler Lagrange equations, where now I lump together all this stabilization or augmentation in S. And this formulation is what is known as the primal dual stabilized finite element method that, that, uh, that I introduced in 2013 for, um, for actually, essentially, for. for uh, uh, indefinite elliptic problems, so, so Ill, it's going to ill post problems. And then we develop this theory that uses now this three ball inequality. Using this three ball inequality, I can get error estimates for the solution in B, in my subset B, which looks like this. So it's H to the polynomial order times theta 
where theta encodes the ill posedness of this inverse problem. And times, this is what you always get, you get some regularity, the abandoned coefficient, right? And this is new for the ill post problem. I get delta, and delta is the perturbation, some measure of the perturbations, and I get h to the minus k delta. I see this is not so, this is not so nice, but why do I get this? Well, I get this because if the, the, if the data is perturbed, this is an ill post problem. An ill post problem doesn't necessarily have an exact solution. And if it's perturbed, it most likely, likely doesn't. So I cannot assume that there is a solution. If there is no solution, I cannot have convergence and something has to give. So this has to, this has to blow up. So if this didn't blow up, then I could prove convergence without order. So you see, now I have another, there was one idea which led to these contact problems and using the same ideas, I can now get a method for data simulation. So let's just look at some numerical examples here. I have now the three, two different subdomains, omega one, so I get data over here. So you see now I have almost the whole boundary. So this should be relatively, hopefully easy to compute and a much harder problem where I only have one side and I want to compute this. And this is my B, it's the square inside. Okay, so let's see what happens. This is the solution I have given data. This is the, in this, the difficult case I've given data out here. This is the X component of the displacement. This is the Y component of the displacement. I have an 80 times 80 mesh, I have second order polynomials, otherwise it's just a standard finite element method for the, for the elasticity, right? And I have some random perturbation here, which is order of H. But since the mesh is, is not fine, this is a, it's a it's quite important perturbation here. And you see, this is the exit solution, and these are the computed solutions. So what can you see? Well, we said that we had data down here, and our B was inside here, but you see, if I go close to the boundary, I go up to this corner, you see that this is wrong. I don't get the right solution. But if I squeeze myself closer to the data, I get the right solution. So discretization, so it's sensitive to discretization error when I go away, and, and perturbation error when I go away from the assimilated data. So let's look at convergence plots. Now we have this data shape. And if you look at these plots, um, this is, um, uh, let's see now, I, I can't remember what they are now. It's P, P1 and P2. Yeah, now I remember. This is P1 and P2. The, the circle markers are P1 approximation. The square markers are P2 approximation. And you see that they are pretty optimal. And so not optimal as a well post problem, but this is, this is age convergence for, for the piecewise linear elements. This is the local error and the global error. So you see, actually, in this case, I can't see any difference if I measure up to the boundary or not, because I have enough data. This is when I add perturbations. So what do we see here? Well, we see that clearly something goes wrong for this. The, the, you have one line here, which is okay. I have not, these are weak perturbations, and the black line, this is H square perturbations, and the black line is H order H perturbations. So you see, if I have H2 perturbations, well, this is H2 convergence. I cannot see them. H, H order perturbations sent me off. So, but the quadratic approximation still has H order approximation, whereas the linear, linear approximation gets poor, poor approximation. But if you have enough data, you see, using this method, we can approximate an ill post problem as well as a well post problem. Let's go to the other case. Now, this is much harder. So this is not first order. This is something like 0 0.4, the convergence order of this guy. So P1 is half the convergence order you could expect. And this is also half the convergence order you could expect for the, for the quadratics. And you see that when you perturb them, well, if you have the perturbation is small enough, it doesn't, it doesn't see it. This is H squared, the perturbation. If the perturbation is larger, so this is order H, then you see that P1 and P2 are almost the same. P2 is actually worse because high order polynomials are more sensitive to perturbation. And um, um, 
but it still gives some reasonable result. And the, the, now you can ask, you, ask the question, what was these, these, these solutions we saw? Well, that corresponds to that point up here. So it was a pretty bad, it was a pretty bad solution. So we can imagine that these guys, they look very, very good. Well, good. So that is the end of this talk. I'm sorry if I was a bit, it took a bit more time than I had hoped for. These are the references um, of, of our work on, so we have the first reference is really how to combine these ideas with unfitted finite element methods, which was a starting point. The second paper here is the flat membrane with the obstacle problem. The third paper is this membrane contact. The fourth paper is the Lagrangian finite element method for contact problems with with, um, with the multipliers, which which was actually the one of the first papers we wrote, but it took very long time to get published. And then this was this is a review paper on these results for the data simulation. Thank you very much.